Exodus 22, I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. To mention the name of Yahweh means to conjure up the image of a totally involved deity. A deity, a God who is completely within the lives of the Israelites and something that they could really feel, see, experience. And that is really unique because no other people ever had this sort of an experience where God intervenes into the lives of the people, leads them, guides them, and the people listen to him, they obeyed him. There were moments when the people did not obey. God was sometimes angry and punished them. But then they realized they had to follow Yahweh. They had to follow the orders, the directions given by their God Yahweh. And in that way, they once again became a people chosen by Yahweh, a people chosen to be God's people. Exodus chapter 3 verse 7 says, I will take you as my own people and you shall have me as your God. And that great event took place during those events of the Exodus. Perhaps no other people in history had such a great privilege. The people of Israel realized that God was guiding them, God was leading them. This relationship between Yahweh and Israel brought about a twofold identity of Israel. Israel was taken by God as his own people. Israel acknowledged Yahweh as their God. That was the identity of Israel. This identity is beautifully narrated in the book of Exodus. It is the, the book of Exodus is the document exposing Israel's roots, Israel's identity. Israel realized that their roots lay outside the promised land. Their roots lie precisely in this great glory that God showered on them. And the book of Exodus not only gives the record of Israel's journeys and itinerary, itineraries, it is Israel's identity papers. Israel really recorded the record of human interaction and divine grace, of human success and failure, of divine assistance and forgiveness. The book of Exodus narrates these briefly but so powerfully. The book of Exodus narrates how divine grace and of human success and failure and of divine assistance and forgiveness all put together. That's the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus with all these events the divine assistance, the divine forgiveness, the divine choice and the human failures all put together becomes the book of Exodus. And that will culminate 
in the Theophany on Mount Sinai when God appears to the people of Israel and God gives them the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments on Sinai was something again that makes the Israelites a unique people. Perhaps no other nation ever received God's commandments in this way. No other people can even claim to be God's people. Israelites could. Though at the beginning, when all these events took place, the number of Israelites perhaps was small. It was not a huge crowd. But gradually, the crowd became stronger. The numbers increased. Even if the number is not so significant, the significance of the events made those events of the Exodus so remarkable. It became all the more remarkable because these events were repeatedly narrated during the liturgical services. And it is those repetitions that perhaps made these events almost like an epic. Getting such huge popularity Perhaps even elements were added so that the dramatic effect on the listeners would be great. But then all this added to the beauty and the greatness of the book of Exodus. The final version of the book of Exodus as we have it today was perhaps composed, put together in the 4th century BC. Already before that, various other writings were there and the experts very clearly distinguish four basic texts. The first one is called the Yavist, the second one the Elohist, and the third one, the priestly writer. Yahwist, because he used Yahweh as the name of God, and he must have written maybe in the 10th century BC. That was the time of the Davidic Solomon's reign, and because of that, all the glory of the kingdom is also seen in those writings. Although we lost most of it, it is only a very short, brief explanations that we have at present, but possibly the original Yahwist text might have been a very glorious one. The second basic order is called the Elohist. The name is given to him because he used Elohim as the name of God. And these writings are from maybe from the 8th or 9th century BC. The third source is the priestly writer who is very much interested in all the sacrifices, all this, all the temple services and so on. And therefore, the experts have put to him as the priestly writer. This is from the 6th century BC when the Israelites were in a all turmoil. Remember in the 5th, 6th century, there was the second exile 587, the Israelites were deported to by Nebuchadnezzar 
and during all those miserable years this particular text seemed to have been composed and the final editor who edited all these in the 4th century BC has retained quite a bit of the original text. Those experts are able to distinguish those things and it's not very important for all of you to note it but just remember these three sources are not completely reconciled. There were elements that were even conflicting reports but the final redactor, the final one who put all this together retained more or less the original text and he has left it like that so that the reader can read it, understand and even make his own conclusions. With this I conclude today. We will move into more details about the events of the Exodus in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. May God bless you.